Om. Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahavir Yankarawa Wahe, Te Jasvina Vadhi Tamastu, Ma Vibisha Wahe. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. We spoke about Dharma last week because uh, we need a framework under which these five sadhanas in chapter 12, Bhakti Yoga, that we are studying. Because without Dharma, then these sadhanas have no place. They're mechanical and they are contradictory and they're disorganized. So it's kind of like someone gives you a location to go to place B. So you have to come from place A to place B. And they give you like a guide that say, go straight 250 meters and then on your first left, turn left. And then keep going left 20 meters. And then when you see a greenhouse, there's a number 25 on it, go inside a house. So this means you very smoothly go from place A to place B because you've been given the instructions, you've been given the dharma, how to go from A to B. Now imagine someone just says, um, no, there's a house, there's number 25, get to it. And you're like, hmm, how do I do that? And then you, know, you, you like deploy your drones, right? And they start like creating these annoying sounds and everyone starts to get harassed by these drones and you're like looking around for house number 25 and you employ your, you know, your SWAT team to go from house to house, investigate. You create so much chaos just to find a house. So in that same way, if we employ our sadhanas without dharma, then it is a one chaotic life, right? So this means we need a framework through which or under which we can put these sadhanas on. So this means besides one, recognizing our interconnectedness with the world, we also have to respect this law of dharma. Besides finding a house, you need to respect your environment. So then the question is, revision, what is this law of dharma that we need to respect? First of all, it is not an externally imposed knowledge. It's not something that is told to you. It is rather an intuitive understanding. What kind of an intuitive understanding? Last week we spoke about two kinds of intuition. Number one is subconscious. This comes from your own experience. And two is Ishwara intuition. Therefore, Dharma is an intuitive understanding that we all have in reference to, number one, how I want to be treated, and two, how others want to be treated. Now, not only do we have to know this knowledge, because knowing is not enough, you need to follow it up with your behavior, with your actions. So this means we need to stick to this fact instead of succumbing to our likes and dislikes of how things should be. And this is not easy. Sometimes our likes and dislikes pull us in one way, and yet our inner voice, that silent voice of dharma, is speaking and saying, no, this is not 100% uh, right. We also said that dharma is relative, okay? Now, the moment we bring in the word relative, immediately, what's the mind gonna do? It's gonna say, this is what I've been looking for. Thank you for telling me relative. I can now start interpreting this according to my likes and dislikes, because it's relative, right? And this is what happens all the time. So this is why dharma is a very sensitive topic and it needs a specific framework in which it can be taught. So this means that the person may bend to dharma because they said, well, it's relative. However, dharma does not bend to the person because dharma just simply provides the consequences in a form of unfavorable consequences if that dharma is violated in one way or the other. So this means it is in your interest to know dharma accurately and to follow it thus. Because who's the one that gets hurt? The person that is violating dharma. 
that doesn't create exceptions. It doesn't say, well, this person had a good track record, 20 years. Now they made one mistake out of uh, all of this great, perfect track record. So I'm going to let him go. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't discriminate. Not even, it doesn't even let you once. So this means it is perfect one-to-one -one ratio between what I do and what I receive. And it never fails. And it keeps track of this for every single individual in all ages, at all times, in the past, present, and the future. So this is this massive, vast intelligence that we're speaking of. Now, a classic example of misinterpreting Dharma is from the beautiful story of the Ramayana. Now there, what happened was an old lady, she's convinced Kaikei to, uh, she was one of the wives of King Dasharat, of uh, Ayota, and he had three wives, right? Okay, thank you. Mina. Three, three wives. Three wives, okay. Now, one of the wives, Kaikei, she was persuaded by an older woman. Now, right there, we can you know, just pause there and say, so when she was persuaded by an older woman to, for Kaikei to exercise her two boons, Kaikei could have remained clear there. She could have listened to her dharma, her inner voice, and say, this is not right. But she failed. So then she went to King Dasharat and said, I would like to ask you for those two boons which you promised you would fulfill if I do ask them at some time in the future. Now is the time for me to ask. King Dasharat was like, gladly, my love, tell me, what are those two boons? And what did Kaikei said, first of all, I want my son, that means Bharat, to be the king. And two, I want Rama, who was, is to, supposed to be the king of Ayota. I want him to be exiled to the forest for 14 years. Now, put yourself in this situation. Imagine someone goes up to you and gives you these two options. And you promise them, remember, in the past that you will fulfill their two boons if they ask. And now they say, number one, I want my son to be the king and I want Rama, the one who you love the most. I want him to be exiled to the forest for 14 years. So this means King Dasharat was right now put on a spotlight. This is his chance to exercise Dharma. But he also lost clarity, didn't he? So what did he do? He, what do we do? We either disregard it or we say, okay, I will honor your promise because I stand by my promise. This is both black and white. What are some options that King Dasharat could have done instead of just fulfill those two boons? Let's look at the situation here. There is a, a person that you love and you promise to fulfill her two boons. And now she, she has asked for those two boons or he has asked for those two boons. And you're putting the spotlight. Okay, what do I do? I either ignore her or, or I kind of treat her, right? I give her a little earful. I give her a lesson on dharma. What is dharma? You're violating it, right? <laughs> Try that working out. It's not going to work out very well. So one of the situations, yes, uh, Victor? But what about also the other people involved in the situation? They, they also have their own dharma. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah. they would have to consider that as well. Okay, okay. So Victor has uh, exactly mentioned what I wanted to say. So, see, King Dasharat is a king of Ayotha. This means he represents the people. So this means one of the things that he could have done was he could have asked the people of Ayotha, who do you want to be king? Do you want Bharat to be the king or do you want Rama to be the king? Because the king cannot make decisions by himself. He needs to include those which he represents. So this is thinking outside the box. What else could King Dasharat have done? He could have went to Bharat and asked him, hey, uh, Kaikei wants you to be the king. Do you want to be the king? Well, what Bharat said, no. Then they could bring that back into the situation and said, Bharat, the one who you want to be king, doesn't want to be king. So in other words, both of these are not violating Dharma. They're simply thinking outside the box while still sticking within the boundaries of Dharma. This is called thinking outside the box. What we usually do is when we present a situation, we say, okay, so uh, yes, I take it or I don't take it. Now think about it this way. You've been given the most sophisticated computer in the world called the brain. And this brain cannot go further than thinking besides the two options, which is it's given. Is this what we're here to do, <laughs> right? Just to say yes or no on the basis of someone else's thinking? They're also limited. So this means it is in your duty, your swadharma, 
to think outside the box. If you cannot think immediately, then you say, right now I'm not clear, but I feel there are more options. Therefore, I want time and I'm not gonna be pressured. So give me a few hours and I'll think about it. The Sharat made this decision to make Bharat uh, the king and he didn't tell the people of Ayodhya. Right, so he should have been up and uh, honest about it. He says, here's what I'm about to do, the people of Ayota, and here's what I'm about to do, uh, uh, Bharat. But he didn't do that. He did it underneath. That's his violation of Dharma. He did it underneath the carpet. For the sake of pleasing, Kaikei. Now, we also touched upon Swadharma. What is Swadharma? It is personal duty, your duty, which undergoes change according to both the situation and time. This means there is no such thing as lifelong swadharma. Swadharma changes every single day. It changes in your family, in your relationships, uh, with whomever you are associated with, your swadharma is flexible. So what happens is we also limit our own swadharma. How? By not thinking outside the box. I just demonstrated an example with Dasharata. Now I'll give you a common example. This happens with parents. Even parents get stuck in what's called parent swadharma. So what happens? Suppose the child doesn't get good marks in class or they do something that is inappropriate. What's the first thing the parent's gonna do? They're gonna either give them an earful, how you should be good, how you should get marks. If you don't, then, you know, then you're not gonna get a good job and you should have A pluses, you should be a good student. All of these shoulds that you should do. Or the other extreme is, oh, let the child be. They've got their own destiny. They come with their own, right, their own prarata karma. Just uh, don't need to fear too much. Just let them, you know, figure it out for themselves. Both are extremes, one or the other. So now let's give you an example of what it means to expand the parent swadharma. Number one, instead of giving them a sermon, a lecture, which is how most parents do it, you could say something like, so child, daughter or son, how do you feel when you go in front of the class to speak? What do they say? Oh, I feel scared. And then you ask them, why do you feel scared? And then they share their feelings with you. In other words, you're letting them open up their feelings because this is something that they don't share with their friends. So this means you're investigating underneath this whole black or white, you should do this and here's how it should be A, B, C, D. This means you're looking at them as a human being. Another example is what I call an innovative father. This is a true story. So what happened is when his son was 18, and now whatever age that is in your culture, when, time, when it's time for them to leave home, what did the father say? Before I answer, what's the usual things that they say? Oh, okay, well, son, don't take drugs, stay out of trouble, uh, you know, don't uh, you know, go too crazy, don't party too much. All of these don'ts and then filling the blank. What is the child actually hearing? Because even though it's true, right? But what's the child actually hearing? Hey, who do you think I am? Do you think I'm so stupid that I cannot figure these things by myself? In other words, you don't have any trust in me, parents. So what did the innovative father say? He said, son, I have taught you everything I could. I've taught you all the values of life. I've done my best. I've made some mistakes. On the basis of that, I now trust that you will make the best from this knowledge that I have shown you. You may make some mistakes also, but nevertheless, I trust that you will make the best of your life. So now think about what's the child experiencing when he hears this or she hears this. Wow, my parents trust me. They believe that I can hold my own in life. This is something that we all as children want to hear. Instead of, no, don't you know, do this, don't take drugs, don't drink, don't do this. It's like, wait a minute, man. Come on, I'm a grown up. So this means even though both are right, it still depends how you approach. This is what we call your swadharma needs to be adaptable. If it's not adaptable, then we get into these black or white notions and it causes conflict. You think you're doing your swadharma, but you're only doing 50% of the job as you otherwise could if you started thinking outside the box like this father. So what does this mean? It means that just like the parent, Swadharma changes according to the child's maturity in that same way, the person, you and I, need to welcome change in life. Because welcoming change means I am making space for my Swadharma to evolve. How do you welcome change? 
you simply make a firm affirmation to yourself. You say, when you wake up, today I welcome the changes. And when those opportunities do present myself, I will be sensitive enough to capture them and at least take a moment to investigate into them if there's something more that I could explore. So this means you literally tell your mind to be sensitive to these opportunities. Okay. Now also, uh, sometimes we say, yeah, however, I'm already doing the best I can. Common phrase. I'm doing the best I can. What often this is referring to is the person's comfort zone. In other words, I've created my comfort zone, my little bubble around me. And in that bubble, I'm doing the best I can. So how do you know that your best is not referring to an unconscious bubble which you have created? You simply ask, is this best in a process of ongoing evolution or is this best a mechanical version of doing the same thing over and over again, which is making me feel comfortable? This is how you know whether you're tricking yourself or whether you're actually generally doing the best you can However, you're also taking new ideas, new opportunities, new methods to expand, to grow. Okay, so this means we don't get trapped into this idea of I'm doing the best I can, but it's actually referring to the comfort zone that we're staying within. What is Swadharma? Two views. The primitive view of Swadharma is you say, I don't want to do this, but I have to. And then we justify a common example in some traditions is the wife has a duty to be submissive and to please. So she doesn't want to do this, but she says, well, I have to, because that's a tradition. This is called the primitive view of wife swadharma. The evolved view, that is the refined view, is to say, this swadharma gives me levels of responsibilities that I have to attend to. But not only do I attend to these responsibilities, but I make things interesting. In other words, you think outside the box because what's the point of performing Swadharma if it's a mechanical, monotonous process of doing the same thing again and again? This means you need to make things interesting. So how do you do that? You simply ask yourself, what can I do something differently? Or am I missing some ways that if I were to attend to them could infuse my job, my work, my occupation with more flavor, with more sweetness? So this means you're literally speaking to your own mind because your mind is a powerful instrument and it only becomes powerful when we enact its power. How? By asking questions. Is there more than what I am doing right now? Could there be more? If there is more, what could I try differently today? Okay. So far, I have revi revised the framework called Dharma onto which these five sadhanas are to be exercised. Knowing that, now we can continue to Upasana Yoga Level 2. Tesham aham samudharta mrtyu samsara sagarat bhavami nachirat partha maya veshita chetasam However, those who worship me, keeping me as the ultimate end, giving up all actions onto me, meditating upon me with a commitment <clears throat> in which there is indeed no other. For them whose minds are absorbed in me, Partha, Arjuna, before long, I become the liberator from the ocean of samsara that is fraught with death. Okay, thank you. Here the question is, who are these Upasana Bhaktas, level tours? And then Krishna says, in other words, those whose minds are set on me as the end itself, because I alone rescue them. And these bhaktas are also called in chapter 7, Jijinatsu. In other words, Ananya Bhakta, where there is no other. And then the question is, rescue from what? And then he says, Mrityu samsara sagarat, ocean of samsara. What is samsara? It involves the six-fold modifications. In other words, it involves the process of uh, birth, growth, maturity, decay, and then death. And then again, birth, growth, 
maturity, decay, and death. Any thought, any emotion undergoes this process. Where is the emotion of happiness now? It is in potential. That is the first stage. It's in existence. When it comes, what happens? It first arises. There's growth to it. And then it starts to go through maturity, does it not? It starts to go to its peak. And then there's a process of decay. It starts to lower its intensity. And then slowly, slowly, that emotion which you were so reveling in is no more. Until another emotion pops up and it undergoes the same thing. Not only does this happen to emotions, but also thoughts, but also your own body, this entire life of objects. Even a tree undergoes this process. There's a seed in potential. And in that seed, that potential grows into a nice little blossom. It grows, matures, decays, and dies. This is samsara. So this means when we speak of samsara, it is neither good nor bad. This is, a, a, again, a very primitive way to look at it. Samsara just means a mixture of sorrow and happiness. You can't say samsara is just all suffering. There's also a lot of beauty and health and harmony and joy in life. However, it is short lasting, but so is sorrow short lasting. So this is one advantage of samsara. Neither is happiness long lasting, but neither is suffering long lasting. Whatever comes, it's subject to be gone. Okay, now the question is, why are they saved? these bhaktas. Firstly, because of their sincere struggle, their effort to antakarana shuddhi. What is this? To purify your mind. That means they choose the path of shreyaha, the path of what is morally right versus preyaha, what is or what brings immediate gratification. Okay, why else do I rescue them, says the Lord? Because they conform to dharma. This means they, dis, they resist the temptation of participating into their likes and dislikes. I like to swear, therefore I will. Very easy. This is called preyaha, path of immediate gratification. But what is dharma? Even though I, there is a need to swear, I choose not to because people around me will hear. And that's also going to affect their state of mind. This means you're including the environment. This is called shreyaha, path of what is morally right. It's much harder, but it provides this purity of the mind called antakarana shuddhi. What happens when the mind becomes pure or the more pure the mind becomes? You naturally start getting attracted to jnana yoga, to knowledge. Because you don't want just a pure mind. You want to now know what is the nature of this reality. How did the universe come about? Who am I? What am I doing here? Where do we all come from? How is this universe made? So this is a natural byproduct once the mind starts to get refined. I'm talking about jnana yoga, right? I mean, self-knowledge. The question is, what is the reason for this jnana yoga, which alone can fulfill liberation, moksha? Why specifically can jnana yoga alone provide liberation? So let's provide you the logic for this. All four sadhanas that we're talking about, right? Upasana yoga level two, level one, karma yoga level two, level one. All of them require actions. What kind of actions? Either a mental action or a physical action. So this means it implies sustaining a karta, sustaining an independent doer, because you need a doer in order to continue performing the actions. This is just common sense. Now think about it this way. Even if you say, I surrender to God, from a higher standpoint, even this has a logical flaw. What is the logical flaw if you say, I surrender to God? There's no separation between I and the God. The God uh, okay, good. You have to surrender the surrenderer. I surrender myself to God. How can you say this when everything is God? How can everything surrender to everything? So this means, as long as I say, I surrender to God, what are you doing? You're retaining a separate individual from the whole. Now, here's the irony. To say I surrender to God has a lot of benefits because when you say that, you're actually acknowledging the presence of God. But there's a certain point when you keep on saying that when it just no longer makes sense because you say, well, wait a minute, if I want limitless, the whole, then if I keep on saying I want the whole, 
then how are you ever going to be the whole if you keep on retaining that person who wants that door, that karta? Okay, so that's the first logical flaw. So this means if I say I surrender to God, what are you doing? You're, you're sustaining duality. You can never arrive to advite them. So then what is the only solution to then grasp the whole reality? Because God is everything. The only solution is jnana yoga. What does jnana yoga say? You are already non-separate from the whole. Therefore, the recognition of this fact is what we call moksha. That's all moksha is. I recognize that I am never apart from what I am seeking. The seeker and the sought are not two. They never were two. I only thought they were two on the basis of my false knowledge. That's why jnana yoga simply means removing false notions which are simply invalid. And when those notions are removed, then the person who was looking for the whole recognizes I was never apart from the whole in the first place. Let's be very skeptical here. Let's bring a skeptical student who's going to give us some problems. Suppose the student now says, um, how is it that I'm already part? How is it that I'm the whole? Prove it to me. I am part of the whole. That's my objection. So now suppose we all say I am part of, because I tell you, this is a very common st statement in the spiritual field that says, I am a part of the whole. I do not understand how I am the whole. So let's now investigate this through logic. So I will say to you, okay, when you say you are part, what specifically are you referring to? Are you referring to which cell in your body are you referring to that is the part of the whole? Are you referring to your nose, to your legs, arms, teeth? Are you referring to your thoughts? So which specific thought is part of the whole? Problem number one. Problem number two is by the time you show me the cell, you say, okay, I, Andre, I've got it. This cell over here, that is what I'm referring to is part of the whole. By the time you say that, one second later, how many changes has that cell already undergone? So many changes. Now suppose you say, yeah, this, see this thought, this thought called I'm part of the whole, that makes it so. By the time five seconds later, is that thought still there? No. So again, what specifically are you saying when you say you're part of the whole? Point to me, which part of you is part of the whole? So just to give you a metaphor, it's kind of like a branch. Imagine you're a branch right now of a tree and the branch of a tree says, I am part of the tree. Counter objection is what specifically which specific part of the tree are you referring to when you say tree? Because what is a tree? Now you have to look into the tree itself. Are you referring to the water in the tree? To the carbon in the tree? The CO2? The cellulose fibers in the tree? The lignin in the tree? The leaves? The intelligence which converts the sunlight into chemical energy? The subatomic particles? The quarks, what specifically are you referring to when you say the tree? What I mean to say is tree doesn't refer to any specific part. Rather, when you say tree, the entire being is included, including the very branch that said I am part of the tree. So that's where we trick ourselves. The little branch says I am part of this tree. And yet the very tree it's referring to is not away from. Because when it says the tree, is that branch excluded? No. So this means the doer who is surrendering maintains a sense of separation. As long as they say, I want to unify myself with the tree. Where instead, what does Jnana Yoga say? You are already not apart from the tree. So in that same way, the Jiva cannot be a part of Ishwara. Jiva, you, cannot be a part of God. Because whatever reality the jiva enjoys is the very same reality that Ishwara enjoys. The wave cannot be a part of the ocean. Because whatever reality the wave enjoys is the very same reality the water that the entire ocean enjoys. So there is no question of merger, of union. How can you unify that which is already unified? So this means unity is logically impossible. It is another false notion.
Why? Because you're not inherently bound. This very identity, this identification that I'm not separate, that very knowledge is called moksha, that very understanding, that firm understanding. So this also means Ishwara has no power to give moksha because moksha cannot be created. What is the only thing that Ishwara can give you? Knowledge, gaining which removes the notion that I am not liberated. Suppose that you don't have full knowledge of the rope. Suppose you, you and I are walking now in the twilight, right? So there's just enough light to see what's on the ground, but it's not completely bright, so you don't see clearly. You see a, a rope there, but because you don't see it 100%, because you don't have total knowledge of what you're seeing, what is the mind going to do? It superimposes the next closest resemblance, and that is the snake. So this means I perceive the snake on the basis of my partial knowledge of the rope. So this means it's only until I gain the full knowledge of the rope that the snake perception dissolves by itself. Now, suppose someone says to you, okay, um, so you see the snake, I'm going to give you the rope. Can you do that? No, because the rope is already there. Therefore, you can never gain the rope. You can only remove this false superimposition that my mind is creating only to the partial knowledge of the rope. Therefore, in that same way, you cannot ever get moksha. You can only remove the false knowledge, which is preventing me from seeing that rope. So this means once I gain knowledge of I am Brahman, only then the false perception of myself as a separate individual is removed completely. What is Atma? I am. So this Atma also has no power to reveal itself. And there's three reasons why. One of them is, okay, what is Atma? It means consciousness principle, that which simply illumines whatever is going on in the mind. First of all, consciousness, that is Atma, is not a karta. It's not a door. It is not an agent of action, but rather the illuminator of the agent of action, the illuminator of that one who performs actions. So that's reason number one. Consciousness is not a karta, a door. Reason number two, atma, that is consciousness, that is I am, is never not obvious as the self-evident existence. You always know you exist. You will know you exist tomorrow. You know you exist today. Now, some people will say, yeah, but I exist. I'm going to exist more tomorrow. Like I feel like I exist more. That's a feeling. That's not your existence. Someone's going to say, you know, I, you know, I definitely know now more. I have more knowledge. I exist more. What is that? That's a thought. That's not your existence. In other words, feelings and thoughts are only in your existence. On the basis of your existence, which you are helpless, those thoughts and feelings about existence pop in and out, but they don't touch your actual existence. And what is Atma? Just the innocent, helpless existence. Can't do anything about it. And the third reason why Atma has no power to reveal itself is because it is never more obvious than it is right now. This means in a stage of ignorance, the truth is no more or less obvious than it is obvious in the stage of knowledge. That's the irony, isn't it? In a stage of ignorance, I know that I am obvious. In a stage of knowledge, I know that I am obvious. What's the only difference? I remove those false notions, which said that I'm supposed to be more than I thought I was. So in the stage of ignorance, what do we do? We say, no, no, I'm much more than who I am. I'm supposed to be in this world, expensive world. I'm supposed to feel uh, awesome. I'm supposed to like, you know, uh, feel super aware of the world. In a stage of knowledge, that same person is there. That same presence is there. But what happened? The notions which said those silly statements are gone. This means the person now accepts themselves as they are. They no longer want themselves to be bigger. You know, they want themselves to be brighter. They want themselves to be sort of like in this you know, higher reality. They just say, hey, this obvious ordinary presence is the final reality. There's nothing more to it. In a stage of ignorance, no, nah, there has to be more to it. So then we start attributing these feelings, these thoughts, how I'm supposed to be bigger and brighter, etc. No. Okay, this is also why it is pointless to say, who am I? You heard this question before, right? Who am I? How are you going to get the answer unless you've been told 
in the Shastra, in the knowledge. How are you going to have an answer to anything unless you have read up about what you are looking the answer for? It's kind of like saying to you, uh, what is Alo Gobi? What is Alo Gobi? Alo, what, Alo Gobi. Hmm, what is Alo Gobi? Some of you know what Alo Gobi is, right? Hmm, Alo Gobi. What is Alo Gobi? Okay, okay. Just, just turn your mind inwards. Just ask, what is Alo Gobi? Now wait for the answer. Hey, here's a little tip. Just go on Google and type Alo Gobi. Google is going to tell you it is an Indian dish of cauliflower and potatoes. How do you know that? Because I looked it up on Google. But in the spiritual field, no, it's a different story. Just ask the question, who am I? Don't go into these scriptures. They've got nothing to tell you. Just, just turn inwards and look and then just follow your heart, right? Just go into your heart and get the answer. Hey, what's inside the person who does? Why are you asking who am I? Because you don't know. This means the only thing I'm going to get out of myself is more ignorant notions. Therefore, what do we do? We simply get educated. That is done through the Shastra, which we're doing right now. On the basis of that knowledge, whenever you say, who am I? You immediately get the answer on the basis of the clarity gained in the class. Okay. Now, in verse 8, the next verse we will do, Krishna is going to expound the essence of Upasana Yoga level two. And it is going to involve fixing the mind on this presence of Ishwara's grand order. Mayeva, in me alone. This me, Shankara says, is Ishwara as the comic form, Vishwarupa. May you commit your mind to me. Mayeva mana adhastva. Both mana and buddhi mean the antakarana. So when they are used together as they are here, each has a restrictive meaning. Though both are antakarana buddhis, there is a difference based on the process of thinking involved. Mana is fluctuating between certainty and uncertainty. Sankalpa vikalpa atmakam. Buddhi is the function that leads to a well a certain conclusion, Nishchayatmika. Both must be in me, Bhagwan says. Why, why should he mention each separately? When the mind is placed in Ishvara, is the Buddhi also not necessarily placed there? It may not be so at all. You may not have the commitment that arises from a well-assimilated understanding of what you want. Purushartha Nishchaya, what is Ishvara? Why am I doing this? What is the phala that I'm seeking? The ascertain ascertainment of all this is involved in the Nishchayatmika Buddhi. Then when you place your mind in Ishvara, it will stay there. Otherwise, when there is vagueness about the very pursuit and the nature of Ishvara, other interests are equally compelling and naturally the mind will stray. But if you have determined what you really want, your pursuit is directed and meaningful, which is why the value Tattva Nyanatta Dharshana is pointed out in the next chapter. The question that's being posed here is what does Upasana Yoga level two involve? And the answer, as Krishna says, is Manaha Adhatswa. In other words, learn to place your mind's emotional dependence, that means your emotions, not on finite objects, but on Ishwara's ever available order. Where do we usually place our emotions? In our job, what we accomplished, in our kids, in uh, you know, things to work around in our environment, the, the house to be clean, the garden to be pruned. All of our emotions go out there in those, you know, those finite little objects. Now, that doesn't last, of course. But what is the one principle that is eternal? Ishwara. Therefore, where am I placing my emotions? Where am I putting my dependence on? That which is not only limitless, but also eternal, unchanging. Okay, now how do you do this? This is the question. You do this by learning to contribute. You can contribute your love, your knowledge, your, uh, your presence, your words, your, your solace, your anything that you have of value, you can contribute. So when you contribute, it also empowers you to lift your standards. Because is it not true when you contribute, you want to like, you know, give the best that you can? Is that not true? Yes. So this means when I learn to contribute and when I put my emotions in contributing and not taking, 
then not only are you giving, but also you are improving, you're raising your own standards. Where do we usually get our emotions from? From taking more for me, less for the world. But what is the verse saying? I put my emotions in contributing. What do we say is Ishwara? The entire jagat, the entire world. So who am I actually contributing to? Ishwara itself, because there is only Ishwara here. And what is Ishwara itself? That which provides me unlimited happiness, unlimited joy. Our next is, uh, it says, Mayi buddhim niveshaya. In other words, I learn to engage, you and I learn to engage our intellectual thinking power towards the perceived orders within this universe. So what does this mean? Whenever you're thinking, for example, of the building blocks of life, what do I mean by this? You're thinking about the five elements, you're thinking about cells in your body, plants, animals, beings, including laws like dharma and karma. Don't just think of them as an independent existence of their own. Oh, look, there's an antelope. Wow. Oh, look, there's a butterfly. Wow. What are you doing? You're going one step further. When you see these building blocks of life or these individual entities, you associate them to the presence of the Lord. So it's not just a butterfly. It is also nimitta upadana karanam, the intelligent and the efficient cause. That means it is God in the form of a butterfly. It is God in the form of an antelope. It is God in the form of my spouse. So this means you're adding one more layer than just looking at these objects as objects. When are you not looking at forms? Are you looking at form now? Absolutely. When are you not looking at a form which has a structure to it, which has an organized, intelligent, intelligent little form to it, intelligent design to it? Are you just looking at like a big, you know, big mess of uh, objects flying about, no order? Absolutely not. So this means, number one, not only are you looking at material, but also you're looking at an intelligent formation of that material, which makes that object what it is. And what is both intelligent and material cause? That is the very issue that we're speaking of. Uh, prayer as in japa or uh, normal meditation? A uh, prayer asking for something to, like, you're asking for someone to be healed, to be helped, or your own mind to be clear, uh, things to work out, uh, something that's going to help your life to expand and grow. Why do we require prayer? Let's put it this way. We require prayer because there are many things in life that are out of our control. Okay. And a prayer is a mental action. Yeah. And a mental action has to have a palam and the all-knowing Ishwara gives us the result of that mental action. And I find it also brings awareness in regards to what you're praying for. Like if you are praying for the health of your family, then generally throughout the day, you'll be thinking of the health of your family or well-being of your family. Okay. Thomas says beautifully put uh, what I was going to say. And so Thomas said, okay, I'll give you an example of what Thomas just said. Suppose you say, I want self-growth. I want to be a, you know, a, a good human being, a human being that is, that thinks through layers and layers, a human being that can have depth in, in my perception. What does your mind do despite saying that? It still goes in the opposite direction, does it not? In other words, there's a certain helplessness that you and I recognize. This means prayer acknowledges, one, I am not entirely in control, as Thomas said, but what is in control? Ishwara's order. Now, the second question is, how does prayer work? The answer is, when you ask through the prayer, what is prayer? It is a karma. It is an action, is it not? You're praying. You're asking for something. Prayer is what? A karma. Karma is or requires a, an effect on the basis of its action. Okay, so now let's summarize. What is Upasana Yoga level two? Like putting the Brahman filter on everything that you see and do. Okay, good. So, so in other words, I'm bringing, yes, Victor? It's just putting your mind on God, putting Excellent. your mind on Ishvara. Excellent. So in other words, good. So you're bringing Ishwara into your life. Now the question is, what happens if you don't bring Ishwara, God, into your life? Suppose you do good deeds, right? Good moral actions in your life. 
you're sincerely helping, but you don't receive or you don't, there's no reciprocity. Suppose that happens, and this happens often, right? You're doing the best you can, but you're not seeing any rewards. Now, what, is most, what are most people gonna conclude? They're gonna say something like, what's the point of being good? I'm, you know, I'm doing all of this hard work and I'm receiving nothing. When I'm seeing people using questionable shortcuts and they're getting larger paychecks. And here I am honest and I'm hardly, you know, make, reaping any, not, not any worthy rewards. That's the first thing that, per, one of the things that person's gonna conclude. In other words, there's an inbuilt program in every single person. It's an inbuilt psyche that says, for every X, I must receive a Y. It may not be 100% clean, but it is still in every person if they admit it. If you're honest, you'll say this. For every X that I put out, I expect some form of a Y, some form of a reward. In other words, I want to be compensated for my actions. How do you deal with this strong program that wants compensation, that wants justice, and yet you're not receiving compensation and you're not receiving justice? First of all, if you include Ishwara, then you understand that any action that you put out, the understanding is nothing goes wasted. Nothing. No matter how little of a good action you put out, that is captured by the field. And it is bound to produce a result sooner or later. It cannot not produce a result. If you take out Ishwara, then you cannot think like this. Then you say, well, what's the point? I'm not receiving any benefits. If you bring in Ishwara, what is your understanding? Every action, no matter how small, has to bring some rewards in the future. And that makes you what? That makes you stick by dharma. That makes you stick by morality. So what I'm talking about here is having faith. This is what's called faith. On the basis of my understanding of Ishwara, I know that every small action that I put out, this grand order never ever fails. This means all of my actions, how, no matter how small they are, they will return sometime in the future. Not immediately, but whenever the field or the circumstances are right. Okay, so what we mean here is there is a one-to-one -one ratio between what you do and what you receive. Nothing goes unnoticed. Just a little metaphor to show you. Suppose you have uh, five fingers, right? And one of these fingers says, okay, so I'm doing all of these good things for these other fingers, but I'm receiving nothing. Is this finger away from the whole, from the entire body? No. So whatever this finger does, where is, that, where is that going? Where is the, that karma going? It's going inside the hole because it's got nowhere else to go. So this means sooner or later, this finger is going to reap the rewards. In other words, if this finger helps this other finger, then what is actually being affected? The entire body, the entire system. If this finger hurts the other finger, what's being affected? The entire system. So every single individual in this universe is actually affecting the universe. Every single, every thought that you put out, every action that you put out, you're affecting the entire grand order. And you may not see it. Our minds cannot capture it because it, the amount is so limited. But nevertheless, it is all recorded. Who's recording it? You are. Because you are not apart from the whole. That's why we say God is always watching. Okay, who's watching? You're watching. Are you ever not watching your own actions? No. Suppose that Upasana Yoga level two is also difficult and you just resist this principle of bringing Lord into your life. Then what do we say? You need to scale back to Upasana Yoga level one. And this is going to be in verse nine. Now, the question is, why would Upasana Yoga level two, the one that we've just covered, why would that be challenging for some people? The answer is because the mind simply hasn't reduced the influence of its likes and dislikes. This means it's still pulled towards specific idols, specific symbolisms of what represents divinity. Okay, so in other words, the mind still pulled to single objects which it fancies. And now we have to address this kind of mind. So let's go to verse 9. Atachitam samadhatum nashakno shimayestiram 
apyasa yoga na tataha mam ichaptum dhananjaya arjuna then through the practice of yoga may you seek to reach me continue please mai in parameshvara the lord as saguna brahma if it is not possible for you to place your mind in me steadily for a length of time which is called dhyana meditation what should you do then may you desire to reach me through abhyasa yoga the practice of yoga abhyasa means doing the same thing again and again puna puna not mechanically but with an alertness any skill depends entirely on abhyasa whether you want to drive a car or pilot a plane you require hours of proper practice it is the same here the mind is not able to remain with a chosen object of meditation because of lack of abhi abhyasa we have not learned how to keep it there all of our lives we have been rule gathering unless we forced it to the mind does not stay focused on anything and in meditation nobody forces us nobody forces us although we have acquired many other skills if asked to sit quietly for a few minutes we cannot manage it we get restless that is the problem of a human mind yet when it is compelled to do something it will when we understand a newspaper article it is because our mind finds the topic compelling and remains there for a length of time if we open a thriller we can read it from cover to cover even sacrificing our sleep our attention is drawn and the mind does not stray but when we choose an object of meditation we find our mind wanders everywhere who is upasana yoga level 14 who specifically it is for a bhakta for a person who has a strong association or in other words they find a lot of comfort to certain symbols which represent divinity For example some people you know are drawn to uh, passed away gurus like Ramana Maharishi and they're drawn to Ramana it's like he for me represents divinity some are drawn to Sai Baba to Adi Shankara to Chinmaya to Rama to Krishna there's a specific idol which the person or bhakta resonates with upasana yoga level 1 is not puja it is not physical worship it is not prayer it has it is nothing that involves your jnana or karma indriyani in other words it is nothing that involves your five organs of perception and it is nothing that involves your five organs of action in other words your organs of action your hands your mouth are not moving you're still and you're not using your eyes to look you're not using your ears to listen to things you're not using your uh you know your nose to smell things which means what you are completely still so now we're going into meditation dhyanam ideally with your eyes closed although it doesn't have to be with your eyes closed because there is also a open eye meditation but it is still very uh, a, a person doesn't is not transacting work with the world because anything that is transacting where is that belong karma yoga okay but here we are putting away our eyes our ears our nose our five organs of perception and our five organs of action now what is upasana yoga level 1 what is it it is entirely a mental activity it includes or involves deliberately bringing your mind back again and again to your selected object of meditation what object the one that for you represents divinity now ashtanga yoga of patanjali yoga sutras most beautifully and most accurately captures the actual process how to carry out upasana yoga level 1 so let's talk about ashtanga yoga i've already discussed this in chapter 6 of the bhagavad gita i'm going to bring it again uh, for the rest of us ashtanga yoga has eight steps The first two steps are basically how to live 
a healthy moral life. So the first step of Ashtanga Yoga, you can put on your piece of paper, is Yamaha. What is Yama? It is Samanya Dharma. Okay, now Yama has certain principles to abide by, to, uh, to, to incorporate into our life. The first one is Ahimsa. What is Ahimsa? It is holding yourself back. That means you're not engaging. You're holding yourself back from continuing or from sending out unnecessary discomfort into your internal or external environment. What do most people do when there is, um, for example, suppose you go into a little ticket mall and people are nervous. Everyone's looking around what's going on and you just start to look around and you just kind of join the crowd. Okay, you know, I'm also nervous. What is that? In other words, you're just creating more, you're reinforcing the nervousness in the room. Instead, you just say, okay, why should I be one more person that's just looking around, what's, what's trying to figure out what's going on, if I can just remain calm? In other words, what is Ahimsa? You're holding yourself back from contributing unnecessary discomfort in your internal and external environment. That means being composed not making more drama in your environment because there's already enough drama in this world. So why should a person be one more who just adds more drama? Not being one more angry driver on the road because everyone is looking at you. Everyone's watching you. We learn like babies, you know, we observe others. So if I observing a person that's driving their car, you know, all erratic and uh, irrational, then how is that going to come across to other drivers? Right? So in other words, the person's always careful not to be contributing extra noise into the environment. Next one is satyam. What is satyam? This is about being mindful what words come out of your mouth. Being factual. Don't speak unless you have verified the facts, unless you've seen at least something that you can, something that is, is, is objective, something that's factual. Don't exaggerate. In other words, what often happens is we, go, we come back from a, tr a trip or like some journey. It says, how was it? And we go, oh, it was beautiful. You know, it was this amazing. And I saw these. And we just use all of these adjectives. We just started dumping these adjectives to describe our experience. But is that how your experience really was? Probably not. You probably just saw ordinary people, just, you know, weather, ordinary, you know, trees, ordinary vehicles. So don't exaggerate your experiences. Keep it factual. Keep it objective. Also, don't speak just for the sake of fitting in. This is another common situation that happens. We just want to fit in. So let me just say something so I don't feel excluded. No, only speak if you have something to contribute. Okay, next one is asteyam. Asteyam. This is attempting to earn honestly. Next one is Brahmacharyam, Brahmacharyam. This is understanding that there is no difference between male and female gender. The only difference between a man and a woman is what? The Anamaya Kosha, that's it, the physical body. Everything else is exactly the same. The mind's the same, emotions are the same, everything else is the same. Now think about all of those conflicts that happen on the basis of gender inequality. I was just looking at um, the, on the news, uh, Kamala Harris, how much is she taking on? How much abuse is she taking on simply by being, having a female body in politics? Okay, the next one is Aparigraha. This is about assessing how much you really need and not exceeding those needs. If we don't take the time to say, how much do I really need to survive, to live comfortably, then what's going to happen? The person is going to unconsciously start earning and get involved and get enmeshed in work way more than he or she actually needs to. This happens very often. We don't know how much we need, so we just keep on earning for the sake of security. But if you actually look at your financial statements or you look at your house, you say, wait a minute, I've got simple internet access. I've got food, I've got shelter, I've got the basic essentials. Why do I need more? How is more gonna help me? In other words, you're reassessing how much you really need, keeping it simple. Okay, that was 
that was Yamaha. Next, Ashtanga Yoga step two is Niyamaha. Niyamaha. This is about principles to incorporate into your daily living. The first one is Shaocham. What is Shaocham? Sense of cleanliness. You want to have cleanliness in your house, in your garden, in your car, and in your mind. Why? Because your external environment usually represents your mind. Now, am I saying this is absolute? Does this mean now because you've got a dirty garden, that means your mind's totally messed up? <laughs> no. In other words, there's no absolute. It's just a general gauge. But what, what does Shaocha mean? It means that attempt to keep things around you clean in your office. Put things in their right little category so you find things where they belong. But also try to keep things just generally clean because it makes you, it gives, it keeps your mind clean. There's a direct correlation between internal and external environment. This is why, by the way, you often notice that sometimes people like to clean their house. Why? Because cleaning your house, how do you feel afterwards? You feel good. It's almost as if you cleaned your own mind. So the easy way to do it is just to go and you know, prune the grass or cut, mow the grass or something. And then you go, ah, oh, I feel so good about it. And then you feel good about yourself. So this means you can also clean, clean the environment and also cleans your mind. Okay. The next one is Samtoshaha. Samtoshaha. This is comparing your performance only to yourself, not to anyone else. Often we compare our performance to others. If someone's good, I'm just gonna match them. It doesn't work like that because they have their own life, their own time, their own skills, their own talents. So there is no sense comparing yourself with someone else other than yourself. In other words, how did I do? Am I doing better today than yesterday? If not, then what can I bring into my life to start expanding today? If I am doing better than yesterday, then that is a good gauge that you are on a, on a routine that is, is causing you to grow. Okay, so only compare yourself to yourself, not others. Next one is Swadhyayaha. Swadhyayaha. This is about incorporating self-growth into your life. How? Listening to audios while exercising, for example, while driving a car, also reading books. Next one is tapaha. Tapaha. This is reprioritizing your life. That means you're delegating or removing certain unnecessary responsibilities. What happens in life is we get too many responsibilities. Like, you know, the, okay, one child, second child. Oh, that's not enough. Let's get a pet. No, it's not. Let's get two pets. Let's get a fish. Let's get a parrot. Now they got all of these pets to take care of, children to take care of. Right. So in other words, the person totally consumes themselves by adding more responsibilities just because they sounded like a good idea in the past. And then in the future, you say, oh, my goodness, look at look at my life. All of my time is now going into just taking care of of these needs around me. In other words, keep it simple. That's what Tapaha is. Reprioritize your life and understand you only got so much time in your life. You only got so much power to multitask. Therefore, give yourself a favor by simplifying to those essentials. Okay. The next one is Ishwara Pranidhanam. Ishwara Pranidhanam. This means for every action, there is a corresponding reaction. This means my experience of today is a carryover from yesterday. And the quality of tomorrow is colored in by my thoughts of today. Step three of Ashtanga Yoga is asana. Now, before starting meditation, first find an environment where you won't be disturbed. Maybe a private environment, maybe close the doors. Second, find a seat whereby you can ask, am I going to retain in the seat without moving in this posture for the next 10 minutes? If the answer is no, adjust your body. In other words, you don't want the body to be a constant obstacle in your meditation. Next stage four is pranayama. That's got three long A's. This is inhaling and exhaling in a certain pattern. And it's one of the fastest ways to calm your mind. 
suppose your mind is very noisy right now. What will, and, and you say, how can I calm my mind down? What will I say? Pranayama. There's a certain yogic technique which, involve, which is called the four, seven, eight. In other words, the breathing pattern involves, and we'll do it together right now, you inhale through the nose for four seconds and you count in your head. One, four. You hold for seven and then you exhale through your mouth for eight while making a whooshing sound like this. And you repeat that four times. So here we go. Four, seven, eight. All breathing. Four. Hold seven. Exhale, eight, whoosh. Times four. Okay. Next stage, stage five, pratyahara. Pratyahara is intentionally telling yourself to change the focus from external perception to internal perception. You literally say, I'm now going to use every dark bark, every sound in the external environment to remind me to go more inwards, to fade out the world and rather listen to my inner thoughts to see what's going on in here. So this means you're intentionally giving yourself that command. Next stage six is dharana. What is dharana? You start by focusing on something which you cherish. Why? because the mind has no issue concentrating on something that you love. That is your experience, right? Okay, so in other words, you find something like the rose, like the sun, like a face of, of someone that you love, and you just put that in your mind, in front of your, in front of your, you visualize that, and you just focus on that. And then what do you do? Whenever the mind changes its focus, and I guarantee you it will, that's the nature of the mind. It is both whimsical and capricious. It just goes all over the place. Whenever the mind does that, what do you do? You bring it back to your object of meditation and you keep doing this for X amount of minutes. So this means before you begin the actual practice, a sign, I'm going to meditate for 15 minutes. And please start with a ridiculously small number rather than a ridiculously large number. What happens often is we say, I'm going to meditate now for 20 minutes. And then in five minutes, what happens? You realize it's too hard. In other words, start by saying, I'm going to meditate for 30 seconds. I'm going to do the entire stage uh, asana, pratyahara, uh, pranayama, and uh, uh, dharana, I'm going to do that for 30 seconds. And then you say, oh, this is easy. And the next day, that confidence carries on, and you say, I'm going to now do it for 60 seconds. And then again, that confidence carries on, and you say, I'm going to now do it for five minutes. So using reverse psychology to tell your brain that this is very easy. How do you do that? You simply cut down the time from 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 long to ridiculously short and you increase those increments and each time you inc increase it your brain says what yesterday's 30 seconds was very easy i can definitely do 40 seconds and then next day yesterday's 40 seconds was very easy i can definitely do one minute so you slowly keep increasing like that until you get to a 15 or 20 minute mark okay stage seven is dhyanam it means literally meditation what it really means is your is dharana. What, what are you doing dharana? You bring your mind back to the object meditation when the mind strays. Remember that? So in dhyana, owning to that repetitive action, that becomes less of a hassle now. This means your mind's more spontaneously on your object of meditation. So all dhyana really means is dharana, which requires less intervention to bring the object back into your focus. Last stage, samadhi. What is samadhi? It just means dhyanam, which is done by the subconscious. It's automatic. That means you no longer have to say, oh, no, 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 bring it back. Oh, no, no, bring it back. Oh, back into my you know, past five years. Ago. What am I doing there? Bring it back. Oh, dog barking. Now bring it back. So this means now it is completely automatic. It's spontaneous. What does the upasaka uh, in level one, what, do they, what is their attitude in normal life? when they're not meditating, how do they conduct themselves in normal life? The answer is this bhakta has the spirit of karma yoga. Now you're gonna say, what is karma yoga? Karma yoga means I'm deliberately aligning my actions to the moral order of dharma. 
We just talked about Dharma. Yamaha, Niyamaha. So this means you're infusing your actions with those attitudes. At the same time, it doesn't stop there. You're understanding this very Dharma that I'm aligning my actions to, this very Dharma is actually Ishwara manifest as a law. If you don't include Ishwara, then it is not Karma Yoga. This means you need to include Ishwara in this Dharma. This means you look upon Dharma as Ishwara itself. Okay. So, so here's... Andre, yes? You said about uh, being mindful of what you're doing and offering it to Ishwara back. Indeed, yeah. So uh, you're offering, uh, before you enjoy the results, you say, you know, you're first taking, uh, uh, putting Ishwara into your mind because this is not yours. It's not your rewards. It is reward from the field and you didn't, you don't sustain the field. You don't sustain this world. So therefore your mind goes first on Ishwara and then you enjoy the results. Okay. Now what's the summary of Pasana Yoga level one, which was verse nine, the one that we've just done. Krishna calls Upasana Yoga level one, Apyasa Yoga, otherwise known as Ekarupa Ishwara Dhyanam, otherwise called Ishta Deva Bhakti. What is Ekarupa? One form, that means Ishwara in one form. Okay. Again, what is Upasana Yoga level one? So you're bringing again and again the mind back from everything that the mind goes on to, to the object of meditation. You're doing that deliberately over and over. Why? Because whose mind is naturally quiet? Nobody's. A quiet mind comes with practice. That is a fact. That means anyone who enjoys a concentrated composure where the mind doesn't stray, doesn't come through birth. It comes through ongoing practice for years and years through yoga. So what is the benefit of Ashtanga yoga? You're creating a highly refined, highly concentrated, highly fixed mind that's able to extend its duration on any topic that it gets involved with. The next verse will be Karma Yoga level two. The question is now, what if the person is so extroverted that they just do not get along with meditation at all? The moment they close their eyes, in a war. In other words, for this person, meditation turns into mad itation. And we don't want to go mad while we're meditating. So such a person only enjoys solace how? By engaging with the world. They only find solace and peace by conducting themselves with worldly transactions. This kind of person needs karma yoga level two. And for this, we will speak about next week. Just a question. When we, when we um, talk about bringing it to, to an object of desire or object that you want to focus on, would, does it mean that it could be anything and everything, everything under the sun? It could be a form, formless, or anything that you can bring well, your cannot be a form. <laughs> It cannot be the formless, definitely. It has to be a form. It has to be something that you love, something that you cherish, that's personal to you, that's meaningful, and even uh, in, it invokes emotion, emotion of reverentiality. It could be someone's face. Um, for me, for example, when I do, my, just to calm the mind down sometimes, is uh, I just say, okay, I'm, I'm just doing this just to relax. So for me, it's just like a light, like a light in the, um, you know, in the forehead here. And I just focus on that light, keep returning my mind to the light over and over again. This is actually coming from Kriya Yoga practice that I learned from um, a, a teacher some years ago. And it, it works wonderfully. It just takes the mind, it makes it very quiet. And then, you know, five minutes is enough. Yeah, but... It wasn't like that always. It wasn't five minutes always. It was for hours and hours. It was for 10 hours a day sometimes. So what happened? The mind learned, tr got trained to extend its focus. That means it doesn't start to stray all over. Why? Because of only to the prior practice. So this is where Ashtanga Yoga has huge benefits in your life. Andre, does it have to be a light in your mind or can it be an actual light in the form? Um, it can just be some, yeah, it can just be something that you visualize. Uh, for me, it's not actually a light. It's more like a feeling, like a presence of, of, of light. Like, it's not like, you know, bright. It's just a presence that you put specifically 
put your focus here in the third eye. Yeah. I've used the God's light um, that I, in my altar as a meditation form. The, you know, the, the, the oil light that we light. Right. So is that okay? I mean, the, I've been doing that for a long, long time. Um, if you can, yeah, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as you can hold that object in your mind uh, for, let's say, five minutes. And what's going to happen is, I can even guarantee you right now, once we end the session, you close your eyes, right? And you say, I want to meditate and focus. Choose one object. Here's your homework. Choose, um, let me see, you can choose maybe lipstick or pen or something, or just an ordinary light. And just hold it in your mind right here in the, just above your um, eyebrows right there, hold it for just five minutes. I guarantee you what's gonna happen. It's gonna be like, your mind's gonna go And every time it happens, what are you gonna do? You're gonna say, no, 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 put it back here. So in other words, you're constantly bringing it back to your uh, one center point, one focus. Yeah, uh, it's a fun exercise you can do. Oh, and the other thing. Bill having, oh, sorry, sorry, continue. Sorry, it's okay, go ahead. Uh, will having a like um, devotional background music will that help? Okay, so pratyahara involves withdrawing all of your senses inwards. Um, this is not about now using music or any of that. It's just entirely your world is withdrawn inside. Yeah. Now, yes, music if it initially helps you to fade out the world, then you can use that too. Sometimes even background white noise or pink noise can help to background. Uh, uh, to fade out the background and then you just naturally start to you know uh, not even notice that anymore so yes music and white noise can help om purna madav purna midam purnat purna mudachyate purnasya purna madaya purna meva vashishyate om shanti 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 hi